Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes and this is our 89th video cast and 79th podcast for the week ending July 1st, 2021. Happy 4th of July weekend coming up uh, for everyone. And want to kick it off, we've uh, been on the road a little bit. Our kids had a uh, major swim meet in Tampa. Once again, we're in Tampa. First time we were here, it was the Super Bowl, so we went there. Second time, uh, it was WrestleMania, so we went there for the first time. That was more fun than we expected. Uh, and this time, uh, we were here for the Stanley Cup, so we took advantage of that as well. And this is me with my eldest, Mimi, on jet skis. She likes to go fast. Uh, and we certainly did that. It wasn't quite as fast for those of you who've been with me for a while. Uh, when I was down in Captiva, uh, we talked about uh, ones that were really, really fast. But these topped out at about 50 miles per hour. It was uh, clear water. We just had a blast. So, so that was that. And they did well in the meets. So uh, the eldest got all personal best times for all of our races. And the uh, seven-year-old... Uh, Annabelle, she picked up her first medals and quite a number indeed. Uh, she is uh, doing great, so we're very proud of them. And then we uh, we got to the Stanley Cup. This was the uh, last night. This was uh, face-offs. This is the family. Uh, this is who I ran into in the bathroom, <laughs> Tony Robbins, of all people. And it was funny because we had the same mentor, a, a guy named Jim Rohn. And for some of the younger people... Uh, that are listening in, I'd strongly suggest you go to YouTube and type in Jim Rohn. I think he had a tape set, Challenge to Succeed, uh, way back when I was listening to that in my 20s and uh, had some time to work with him in, in my mid-20s and really made a marked difference on uh, how things turned out. So I would uh, strongly uh, emphasize, so it was really nice to meet Tony Robbins. I listened to his tapes when I think I was 17 years old I was a senior in high school working as a golf caddy, and uh, a lot of changes happened from those tapes. So for everyone that makes fun of the guy on at one in the morning on the infomercials, I think he's made a positive difference in a lot of people's lives, and it was just uh, really nice to, to bump into him at, uh, at the arena last night. Uh, that's a, another picture with the girls, and then uh, Stanley Cup ice sculpture. By the way, if you ever get down to Tampa, they have this setup called the Fire Stick Grill. Uh, it's like one floor up, and they do this whole spread, uh, special spread before the game. And if you ever have a chance to participate, and there's Mimi uh, making funny faces, uh, definitely take advantage. And then this was the place that absolutely went crazy when they won last night. Um, and uh, Tampa's going to have to start to, uh, uh, you know, bribe me to come down for these big games because uh, when I was here for the Super Bowl, they won. Now the Stanley Cup, uh, you know, they're, they're a few games in. They won 3-1 last night. They still got uh, to win a little bit more to get the Cup back home. But uh, nonetheless, good time. So moving right along, I um, want to get into some data here. All the, the next... Three charts I'm going to show you are from Ryan Dietrich over at LPL Financial. Uh, this first one, he shows the seasonality. You know, everyone knows about the worst six months of the year are uh, QT, sell in May and uh, go away. So basically, um, May through October. And it shows distinctively here those months, you know, August, September, October tend to be the, the choppiest and tend to have the lowest results. So uh, something to keep keep your eye on moving forward and something that we're um, focused on our positioning to take advantage of moving forward as well. Uh, this is shows that July is very strong in post-election years. These are the average monthly returns from 1950 to 2020. Uh, and it shows that July is strong and, and uh, we're positioned for that. And then here, this is very interesting. The first six months indicator, if the S&P 500 is up 12.5% year to date after six months, bulls usually smile. The median return, the average return for the remainder of the year is another 7.1%. The median is 9.7% and 75% of the time uh, since 1950 has been positive. So, um, so that bodes very well. Now we're gonna skip over to the ask me anything questions 
Uh, starting with Greg Stewart, uh, want to say, once again, I have to say your video cast this week was just great. And it makes it so easy to be patient and calm to slowly build my portfolio with good value investments. That said, after this week, I'm thinking I might need to rebalance a little. Here's my basic breakdown. It was grouped by sector, 20% utilities, 20% big pharma, 20% staples, 10% energy, 10% financials, 10% defense and aerospace, 10% China. Each group is one half ETF, one half individual stocks, for example. Uh, for utilities, XLU, 10%, also D, 5%, AP, 5%, Pharma's 10%, uh, Pfizer's 5%, Novartis is 5%, XLP, 10%, uh, Clorox, 5%, uh, uh, Kimberly Clark, 5%. Obviously, I'm listening to what you're doing with your individual spot stocks. Uh, anyway, I'm of the opinion that defensive stocks, utilities, pharma staples should do well when the tapering and inflation start, but I'm thinking my money would do better in tech over the summer. Would it make sense to trim the big three and add some tech, probably Amazon or Netflix or even Baba, or do I just wait for new money to add to tech? Um, okay, so first off, great question from Greg. I think this is gonna help a lot of people. Uh, first off, I can't advise you on your portfolio as I don't know your situation. It's not what I do. Uh, I run a long short uh, equity portfolio, separately managed accounts for accredited investors and qualified institutions. So they have a different risk tolerance. Uh, however, uh, I can give you my opinion. And as um, for timing, which you pointed to, I'd expect utilities, pharma and staples to see some renewed interest sooner rather than later, not when taper is imminent, actually uh, just the opposite sooner when rates are subdued uh low rates make their yields more attractive and i think we're we're stuck in this range which we're going to go into in the article of the week um amazon's already moved quite a bit since we started talking about it several weeks back so that might take a breather uh bob is my highest weight in the group followed by netflix and a distant third behind splunk on the tech side They've also had huge moves, so I might wait for some uh, pullbacks on those before I start start to get involved. Uh, for the weights, you know, you, you just want to um, keep in mind, you know, one of the things you can do is go to State SSGA, State Street's website, and take a look at the Sector Spider ETFs, and it shows you the weights of each in the S&P 500. So, you know, 20% utilities and 20% staples is a huge overweight uh, and 10% uh, tech, which you don't have explicit exposure, uh, is a huge underweight. So you're really taking a huge sector bet uh, materially with these size weights. That said, um, uh, I, would per I would be comfortable running a similar allocation personally. So, um, you know, that, that's all I can say to that point. I think, you're, I think you're timely here. And as profits come, you need to adjust and take down exposure as, these thing, as some of these things start to rip. I think it's a really valuable question. It shows you've really been following for a long time. And, um, and I personally would be comfortable with that type of exposure uh, in, in what we've done. And, uh, and I think that's come, come through pretty loud and clear in recent weeks and months. Um, okay, uh, Carter Benson. Hello, Mr. Hayes. Your podcast gives great insight in how one should be thinking about the market as a whole. A question for today regarding regards the very interesting scenario regarding Tencent Holdings, Naspers, and Tencent Music. Naspers is currently trading roughly a 90 billion market cap while their stake in Tencent Holding is worth 230 billion. Firstly, does Tencent Music have any effect on this as it is an American traded ADR where Naspers and Tencent Holdings are not traded on any U.S. exchanges? Next, I assume acquiring Naspers gives you a margin of safety. However, will you be able to extract the intrinsic value from Naspers? Thank you. Okay, so this is a really quality analysis. Uh, I haven't done a lot of analysis on Naspers. I briefly looked at it after, after looking at your question. Uh, uh, NASPERS you can buy on the pink sheets uh, or you can buy directly uh, internationally uh, which complicates it a bit for a lot of investors however 
Um, as with all Chinese stocks, you want to have this in a basket because you just never know what's going to happen regulatorily or, you know, either in the U.S. or in China. So there is a risk. You always want to think of it in a basket. That said, I do like this analysis and I would add this name into a basket if I had to. Now, I have BABA is now our largest actual and notional position. Uh, so I have enough Chinese exposure, so I'm not, you know, doing backflips to get exposure. But if you're just building uh, Chinese exposure new and BABA's kind of gotten away from you because it's rallied a bit, um, and some of the others um, you may have missed, like Xpeng, and um, if you were doing Neo, and that type of stuff, uh, and you feel like you've missed the early stage of the move, this might be a way to get exposure. I think it's interesting. I think there's a decent margin of safety. I think it has enough a track record, and I like your analysis, Carter. So uh, uh, I, I personally would would feel pretty comfortable having it in a basket of you know, three, four, five, five Chinese names. I like the timing of it and I like the thought process behind it. So good, good work on that. Uh, John Diamond, hi Tom, great shout out for your video cast. We look forward to the party in Connecticut when Baba reaches 420 in June of 2020, ha ha ha. Okay, this is interesting. You know, when I saw these Alibaba um, uh, call options at a 420 strike, I started to think, Maybe it's Elon Musk buying all this premium uh, because he seems to have a fascination with that number, particularly if you recall when it related to funding secured. So, um, and by the way, you're going to see as we move forward, there was a ton of option premium in BABA this week. And I think it, more of it actually came in at 420 as well. So there you go. And second, I didn't commit to any party. So uh, <laughs> uh, you can go back and check the, ch check the tape uh, as you can check all the tapes every week and, and go back and see what we were thinking when. Okay. Your knitting is definitely sector rotation. Can you help us understand which factors influence sector rotation, e.g. nominal bond yields, etc.? Finally, what's your view on inflation for the next three to five years? Thanks. Short term inflation, I think. Um, okay, so um, I think last week I covered this. So what I do each week, not excuse me, not each week, every single day, is I go to finviz.com and I just sort by large cap stocks over $2. 39 pages come up, 25 a page, it's about a thousand stocks. And I just go through them one by one. And I just see these patterns that repeat you know, over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, and I'll see a whole group down for some reason, and then I go look at it. And um, I start to do fundamental analysis, I start to do an earnings analysis, I start to look at individual companies, I start to get on conference calls, and I make a determination, is this group uh, down for a reason, and it's going to stay down? Or is this a temporary shakeout? And that just comes from a lot of experience uh, of um, of, of seeing how these things respond to different conditions. And sometimes it's a lot of different conditions. So <laughs> to your point, do, do bond yields uh, play a factor? Sure, sure they play a factor. Um, when, you know, bond yields are low, tech and, and yield sensitive sectors do better. So that's why when, uh, and also rate of change has a lot to do with this. So that's why when yields went from 100 bips to 175 bips in six weeks, tech, utilities, pharma staples all got crushed in uh, uh, February, early in the year. We start buying them February 24th to, to March uh, 4th. You can look at the two articles. They ripped up. Uh, now those pharma staples and uh, utilities are consolidating. We're going to talk a lot about that and why we think they could have a second leg in coming months as uh, maybe yields stay subdued in the coming months before starting to rise again and maybe ending the year back half uh, closer to you know, 190, 200 basis points, at which time the in anticipation of taper, at which time the reopening trade starts to kick in and, and those groups that we think will take a break imminently uh, and, and, and have to some extent in the last few weeks since we've been talking about it, June uh, banks and energy and some of the cyclicals uh, actually recover and rip higher towards the end of the year. Uh, so we're just looking at best, highest and best use. And right now we think it's away from cyclicals 
uh, and to these groups, they might just grind sideways, they may correct, but we, we think some of these others that have been doing nothing uh, can now, um, or resting, can now take, take off again. So we're gonna drill down into that. Great question, John. And then finally, from Ben, first name only, Hey Tom, podcast question please. Has anything changed this week regarding your feelings on the timing of the Iran deal and oil's pullback? Uh, how do you expect this week's OPEC meeting to affect oil prices? Thanks, Ben. Uh, so, uh, okay, well, maybe I can get right down to those uh, articles. Let's see if I have those. Okay, so uh, the answer is not really. Um, so first off, you're seeing more of this, what we talked about last week which is uh, Iran restricts IE, uh, IAEA access to main enrichment plant after attack diplomats uh, and Iran says nuclear site images won't be given to IAEA as deal has expired. So this is, you know, these are the things that, uh, you know, dictators do when they want money from the developed world is they start to become belligerent. It'll be the guy from uh, North Korea next. He'll be back uh, firing his, his missiles when he needs food and he needs money. Uh, right now it's Iran and this administration more likely is more likely to be amenable to, as it has similar actors that crafted the first uh, uh, Iran deal that gave them a lot of money for not doing very much. Uh, expect that to come probably sooner than later uh, now that COVID seems to be a little bit more under control, uh, certainly here in the U.S., it's, it's you know, really in good shape. Uh, and the focus is, becomes on ge geopolitical matters with China and with uh, Iran. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think you could see an Iran deal in the next couple of months. Uh, the market's not focused on it. It's uh, focus on OPEC. The interesting thing about the OPEC deal is the rumors are, uh, first off, the meetings got delayed till Friday as the U UAE objects to the new oil deal. So that's interesting. But uh, what they're saying is uh, they may raise in August at a slower pace than they had anticipated they would raise along in line with the long-term plan that we started talking about last June when we posted the Rystead data. You can look, I think it was the third week of June, you can pull up the article when we anticipated this whole move in oil. Um, there is an awful lot of excitement from too many people that that were down on oil when it was $30 and when XLE was um, uh, way down on October 15th when we were hammering Go look at the October 15th article under uh, the sentiment category on hedgefundtips.com. No one wanted it there. And the same people that not only didn't want it, but made fun of people who did, are now the ones buying with it up 100, 150%. And when I see dumb money start to get in like that late, um, I my tendency is to think that it's gotta be exhausted in the short term. And I think it's gotta be a meaningful enough pullback that does not punish those who have been in since August, September, October, because they're up 100, 150%. So uh, 10 or 15 or 20% pullback means nothing. They're not gonna get shaken out, uh, which, which is our case. But those who just bought in because they're, they're reluctantly forced in because they're underperforming, why? Because energy is the best performing sector. It just had its best uh, first six months of the year in history. Uh, and now everyone wants it, up 45% year to date for the sector, followed by banks. The two things we pounded on last year, no one wanted. This year were the best two performance of the first six months. So I think with everyone turning uh, at the exact wrong time, my spidey sense from just years of, of doing this is that they're going to knock the stuffing out of these Johnny Come Latelys, whether it's going to be OPEC, uh, you know, screwing up the, uh, tomorrow or... Uh, the U.S. doing something silly with Iran. You can count on something or something that we don't know that we don't know. Uh, some big oil find or whatever it is. It's just going to be enough to take 10 to 20 percent out, which means some individual names will be down 25 uh, percent. And um, and all the, the fresh money that's now excited about oil will get pounded and they will have to sell because they will be taking serious losses. They don't have any uh, built up cushion or margin of safety to just ride it through. So no, nothing's changed. 
how do you expect uh, OPEC? Me okay, so we covered that. Um, okay, good. So we can get rid of these oil articles. Uh, and here's another thing. Oil. Co oh, this is interesting. Oil companies bet on $100 a barrel as they rush to sell assets. Okay, <laughs> that is an inconsistent headline. So Chevron's selling some assets, and and the point is, they know that if oil got to a sustainable $80 the rig count would just start to shoot up again. Um, OPEC would start to put oil back on the market uh, to keep it at a level that would disincentivize massive rig count ex expansion in, in the Permian and in Shell's place. So Chevron's getting ahead of this and they're smart. They, they, they know the game now is not drilling holes in the ground. The game now is to become tobacco companies. That, as everyone's regulating you, you uh, simply um, return capital to shareholders, and that's exactly why the Altrias and the um, Philip Morris were some of the best performing stocks over the last 20 years as they were regulated to hell. The big got bigger, they returned capital to shareholders, and they had unbelievable to total returns. As a matter of fact, um, I wanted to... Dividend Growth Investor um, had a thing out. Uh, I'll see if I can pull it up. I'll see if we have time for a little bit later. But um, okay, so let me just see if I can get this up real quick. So basically, he showed how if you had invested in cigarette stocks, when they were, you know, be becoming to be hugely regulated, then you would have basically doubled your money. Uh, here we go. This is this is the exact uh, at dividend growth is his handle. Altria was selling for twenty six dollars per share a decade ago. It has also distributed twenty six dollars per share in dividends over the past decade. So what you bought the stock for, you've received back in dividends. The 2011 investor received their investment back and owns stock now worth $47 a share. Oh, and by the way, they also earn a yield on cost of 13.23% today because the dividend is, has grown. And then I responded to his tweet and I said, this is what big oil will look like over the next 10 years. So that's exactly the story of what you can expect, which is why we've always been promoting high up the food chain, like the Exxons and Conoco's and that type of stuff. So just think if you buy Exxon at $60, um, over the next 10 years, you get $60 of dividends as they increase uh, dividends over, over the next 10 years. Maybe you won't get that much, but um, in, in terms of dividends and buybacks, the return compounded return might be in that neighborhood compound annual growth rate of total return uh, of capital through buybacks and dividends could very well be uh, in excess of doubling your money and more likely than not you'll have a dividend yield greater than 10 percent on your cost with a stock that's 120 or some, some odd dollars so so i think this is a perfect model to, to be looking at as it relates to big oil is look at what, what's happened to big tobacco and dividend growth investor laid out the stats that, that I tied to uh, to oil and he liked it and obviously agrees he knows the game. Uh, okay, Feds Kashkari says inflation. Oh, uh, someone asked, uh, oh, but what's your view on inflation over the next three to five years? Uh, it's going to be, uh, John asked, it's going to be higher than trend, uh, I think, you know, between it's, you know, the Fed target is 2%. I think it'll be consistently between 2 to 3%. I don't think it'll get out of control because I think that technology is still disinflationary. Uh, we'll have labor from different parts of the world that will continue to be disinflationary. You'll have short-term supply shocks as a result of commodities. Uh, we expect commodities to be strong over the next three to five years, so that'll put upward pressure. But I, I think the mean uh, trend line is going to move from 2% to 3%, which means there will be a period of time where it's going to run hotter than 3%, uh, but, but also 
time that uh, it's, it's going to run below. So I, I think the trend line is just going to be a, a phase shift upwards uh, from two to, you know, two and a half, 275. Uh, and that's also going to be a function of just demand growth and real growth coming to the economy. 72 million millennials, you can't have that type of demographic boom and housing formation and furniture and baby carts and cars and all the things that drove eight, 1982 to 2000 with the boomers and, um, you know, the, the 1948 to 1966, same type of boom. Uh, so, so yeah, it'll be higher than average, but I don't think it'll get out of control. And the other thing Kishikari says, inflation will be temporary, workers will return. Uh, I tend to agree with that, uh, that you're going to see a supply of labor of the 9.3 uh, that are holding out uh, come back after September, a vast majority of them, and that will put downward pressure on uh, wages. And hopefully sooner than wage inflation kicks in in a material way, uh, because wages are sticky. So you don't want to see in the next few months wages get too high as, as, as uh, businesses compete for labor. Uh, because they can't really lower that even after the supply comes back online uh, as much as you would think. So um, so th those are things to keep on the lookout. The other thing that's happened is a lot of businesses have adapted to people not wanting to go back to work and they're replacing them with technology. So that will also have downward pressure. Uh, my suggestion, uh, probably aren't many people listening to this podcast that qualify for this, but if you're sitting at home waiting for September, I think it's a mistake for two reasons. Number one, your skills get, um, uh, it, it's the wrong lifestyle mindset, number one. You always want to do more than you're paid for as an investment in your future. It, it only serves you. But number two is um, when you go back, you'll either be have been replaced by technology or you'll be competing with the other 9.3 million people, half of which are going in, which is going to make you less competitive. You, you use this opportunity now to be in a position where you can, accept greater responsibility because your boss needs you more than ever before. And then by the time the other people come back, you'll be at a higher level and that could be a career jump that keeps you ahead of the pack for decades to come. So uh, jump on the opportunity that is right now with uh, um, businesses and business owners needing labor. It, it enables you to take on more responsibility, to ask for more responsibility to ask for more wages and uh, and to really get a leg up on your career that can really set you ahead for a long time to come. Um, okay, Carl Quintanilla, Chase Card Spending Tracker, we see you, this is JP Morgan. Uh, we're now 17.9% uh, over two years ago and then changed from pre-COVID trends. So we're running 2.8% uh, above the 2019 trend. So it's positive, obviously, the consumer's coming back, which is nice to see because the stimulus checks, I think, are quite uh, used up by now. I think the last ones were earlier in the year. Lizanne Saunders put out a bunch of stuff. She's from Schwab. You can follow her at Lizanne Saunders. Uh, <clears throat> of 24 historical occasions that the Dow Jones gained between 10 and 20% the first half of the year, only once did it fail to finish the year positive. Uh, unfortunately, that one time was 1929, the worst ever entry point for equities. But, you know, go with the averages. The conditions are different uh, at this stage. Uh, full year was positive, and you can see this data. So this confirms what Ryan Dietrich over at uh, LPL was putting out with his data that we covered. Uh, this is interesting. Other than January 2020, Bloomberg Pure Growth Index just had its strongest month relative to pure value on record. This is what we've been pounding the table on for the last month which was that it was time to get into tech and to lighten up on some cyclicals, which we did. And, uh, and this is what, what's happened. You can go back to our articles on hedgefundtips.com, click on category sentiment or category um, commentary, and then just go back to the articles from early June and you'll see how we were uh, laying this out. And, and that's exactly what's taken place. We think we're gonna see follow through. Also, reopening stocks have outperformed stay at home basket since March 2020 low um, but ladder has gained some ground over the past couple months and performance gap is starting to narrow okay so what they're saying is let's see da, 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 da. 
Okay, so they're saying that, that, that some the same thing that, that the last chart said is basically the tech and the growth are starting to get a bid, and we've talked a lot about why that is. It has partially to do with rates. It has partially to do with summer seasonality over the last 20 years, and we'll cover all that. At Macro Charts also put out another interesting uh, chart this week. We talked about him last week. Five-day breath hit, uh, nearly hit 70% among the top 5% strongest since 2009. Concern over breath is another example of traders with, quote, one foot out the door all year, i.e. climbing a wall of worry is, is what I've been uh, phrasing it as. Pullbacks can happen, but this is now not how bull markets usually end. Follow the trend, and he outlines all the times that you've had uh, five-day advanced decline breath percentages of similar magnitudes, and you can see uh, with the exception of two times uh, that were near tops, the, the rest of the times were buying opportunities. And so far, we're seeing that type of follow through. And then finally, I love this chart from Liz Ann Saunders. She took it from Gl uh, Bank of America Global Investment Survey. Tech fund outflows continuing to accelerate. This is from um, the seven week cumulative as of June 29th. The last time you saw these kind of outflows to tech was January 19th. Look what happened to tech. Let's go back to January 19th. Take a look here. This is where you saw, look at this. This is just hysterical. Okay, January 19th. This is where you saw the same type of tech outflows, the same magnitude. And look exactly what happened. Same type thing. You had a bottom here, bottom here, and then boom, a rally. So, um, you know, that's, <laughs> that's all you need to know. Um, okay. A couple things I wanted to cover on different indicators we're looking at just to show you that quite a number of them aren't really uh, at extremes. Here's NASDAQ cumulative volume ratio. Looks like it's just getting started. NASDAQ declining issues tricks. Again, closer to a bottom than to a top. Um, what else are we looking at here? Uh, NYSE Burke high lows. This one's less reliable, but uh, not at an extreme. This uh, material stocks, by the way, this is kind of interesting. Materials have had a big sell off here. Uh, something to keep your eye on as opportunities uh, present themselves. I've looked at a number of the material stocks. Some of them are starting to get attractive, but nothing I'm really like pound the table excited about. But that could change in coming weeks as uh, if, if they get hit. Dow intermediate term breath momentum. Again, you know, closer to where you want to be buying than selling. Uh, mid cap intermediate term volume momentum oscillator same story uh, this one's getting a little elevated on the NASDAQ uh, McClellan summation index again looks like it's turning up uh, National Association of Active Investment Managers this actually uh, prints midday on Thursday we put out the we write the articles on Wednesday night and put them out Thursday morning so again they chased just as usual they uh, puked out when the market was down now they've been chasing up once again. It looks like they've got more room to chase in the next few trading days. Uh, now, this is interesting, PMO buy all. This is the uh, percentage of index on PMO crossover buy signals. All that is is like a MACD cross. It's not that important other than the fact you can see <clears throat> where we are. Are we like overdone and start to look for uh, lightening up or on the upside or are we oversold here we're kind of mid-range so again it doesn't point to like dump all your stocks just because we've had a big run same thing with the Dow Jones crossover same thing with the uh, uh, S SPX is closer to where you want to be buying historically versus selling like just getting started so there are more indicators pointing to like I'm comfortable having good exposure here I want to be selective on the sectors, and we'll talk more about that. But, um, you know, there's nothing here. You know, obviously people point to like, oh, look at the put call. It's down here. But, you know, that's just VIX coming off of really elevated levels. And that, that's the kind of pattern it follows after like heart attacks, um, which we had last year. And then... Uh, was there anything else? New York, uh, NYSE, McClellan Oscillator, same thing, kind of mid-range. Um, the SKU we're going to cover in the article. And that's about it. So I just wanted to give you kind of a quick overview on some of the things that we look at. Uh, none of them are magic. They're just, you know, you look at a bunch of them together and say, where, where are the 
where are the probabilities, where are the odds? U.S. and Japan conduct war games amid rising China-Taiwan tensions. I like this in the context of uh, this will force China to concentrate on the internal consumption prong of its dual circulation mandate, uh, which has always been a hedge against uh, difficulties with foreign trade coalitions. And uh, this type of, obviously, we're not going to stand for them taking uh, untoward action towards Taiwan. That type of tension may hinder trade. It won't hinder BABA. If anything, the Chinese government will rely more on BABA and invest in BABA to ensure that they get the domestic consumption that is part of the dual circulation. They believe they can one day be a total internal consumption economy like the U.S. could be uh, if they had to, like 70% consumption. That remains to be seen, but the only way they're going to do it is partnering with their b biggest and best domestic platforms, namely Alibaba. So that's one of the reasons we love Alibaba. The more this tension persists, the more they need them versus uh, persecute their own, and that, that bodes well. This I love to see. Lee Cooperman uh, plans his, I know he gets my weekly note and podcast video cast, whether it had anything to do with his decision to get into BABA, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not that presumptive and I could care less. I, I think we have a similar way of thinking um, and um, really super guy. Met him a couple times at um, hedge fund dinners for Mones Crest Hart uh, in the city. And um, he's always been very nice when I've reached out and, um, and, uh, and, and this was great to see. So he was on CNBC this week. And he said, so he's basically saying what I've been talking about. So Lee Cooperman plans to stock pick his way to success, not expecting much from the overall market. And we've talked about that. Um, you know, rallies under the surface is where money is going to be made. Uh, we don't think the back half is going to be as good as the, the front half. Our base case since the beginning of the year was mid-teens returns for the year. Uh, we're already up 14 some odd percent plus dividends, uh, just over 15% total return. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be a straight line to the finish. If we get another few percentage points um, uh, by the end of the year, that's fine. But I do think there's going to be a lot of money to be made under the surface. And uh, what Lee is saying, let's see, everybody's worried about inflation. Da, 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 da. Uh, okay watching the dollar. Okay, in terms of individual stocks, Cooper revealed that one of his biggest holdings is fintech company Fiserv, which I totally agree with, uh, which he has said has an attractive valuation. He also owns Chinese internet companies uh, Baidu and Alibaba. So that was pretty exciting to see. Um, I, I tend to find myself overlapping with him. I'll, I'll either be getting into trades or thinking about trades and then he'll come up and I'll be like, wow, you know, that, that is good. And that's always a good sign. This guy's a legend and, um, and, and, and phenomenal. Um, okay. Alibaba is said to be making its first major investment since antitrust woes. What's interesting about this, as I talked about last week with Ant Financial doing the uh, credit scoring system with the government, Jack Ma controls Ant Financial. That's a sign of cooperation. That means the IPO could come out. Alibaba owns a third of that. That's a good thing. Now, this week, um, the Alibaba has teamed up with the provincial government in Jiangsu, among others, to buy a stake in the retail arm of Suning in a move that could help Alibaba boost its competitive edge against rival JD.com. The deal, which is said to be nearing completion, would add, the, add to the 20% stake that Alibaba already owns in Suning, one of Chinese biggest retailers of appliances, electronics, and other consumer goods. Again, internal consumption, Chinese government dual mandate. The company owned by Chinese billionaire Zhang Jindong is valued at roughly $8 billion, as per Bloomberg. Um, okay, why it matters. The deal needs approval from state administration for market regulation. The increasingly powerful Chinese antitrust watchdog and could be announced this week. The report noted the development is being seen as a departure from the antitrust troubles for China after uh, uh, and Alibaba after it paid a record $2.8 billion fine for anti-monopoly violations. So from adversarial actions, fining, paying, to cooperative actions, um, co-investing, in the same thing, 
and uh, Alipay helping with the digital yuan rollout uh, and, and all these things happening. So, so we like the progression here and we think that's going to persist and it, it will persist more the more the Chinese government needs them. Uh, which seems to be uh, um, improving on a daily basis on that front. Barron's had a, I believe, cover story this weekend on uh, utilities. Nextera is the country's biggest electric utility, a leader in renewables. So I think we're going to start to see more of that again. Uh, Netflix, which is a name that we talked about a couple, three weeks ago on uh, the claim and countdown, has had a nice move. Uh, it got upgraded from Credit Suisse this week. Uh, Douglas Mitchelson from neutral to outperform while maintaining a uh, price target of $586 a share. He says if content is king, Netflix still wears the crown. And we've been talking about the back half slate and the international expansion, etc. So we continue to like that. Um, DD went public in the U.S. So that does not imply to me that this administration at $67 billion valuation it does not imply that this administration or SDC is going to be adversarial towards Chinese listings or further delistings beyond the military related ones that have already been um, uh, picked out. Uh, so that that is kind of a green light for Chinese IPOs and Chinese companies, in my view. Um, and we covered the, uh, the oil. And then as it relates to inflation, everyone knows lumber prices are rolling over, grains prices are rolling over. Uh, lumber in particular dropped 40% in June, the biggest monthly drop on record. Some of these home builders have really gotten uh, corrected in recent weeks. I think that's going to be an opportunity over the summer to, uh, if you don't have housing exposure to, um, to establish some. Or if you do have housing exposure and you lightened up when we were talking about uh, lightening up on cyclicals and you want to add back, I think there'll be opportunity this summer to do so. And I think these are going to be secular uh, opportunities for the next three to five years. Uh, this was interesting. Fannie and Fr in Wall Street Journal, Fannie and Freddie overhaul reboot benefits many mortgage players. While the share of mortgage giants have plunged, stocks of others in the industry may see a boost from a change in policy. And these are particularly, um, so the Supreme Court ruling that a government sweep of the housing giants profit didn't exceed their regulator, regulator statutory authority and that presidents can readily replace the head regulator was a one-two blow to Fannie and Freddie shares, which are down more than 40% in the last week. It means the Biden administration can now appoint a new chief overseer rather than keep the holdover from the Trump administration, who is seeking to release the companies from government conservatorship during his term. That means, so what they're talking about are the, um, under uh, President Biden, the GSE's regulator may try to roll back some of those measures or put in place other initiatives with the primary aim of making mortgages cheaper and more widely available. If GSEs were to cut fees or expand the type of borrowers or loans they back, that could increase the market size for firms that originate many so-called qualified mortgages, the type that the GSEs buy, such as rocket companies, UWM Holdings, UWMC, that's a SPAC with warrants, by the way. We own a lot of that. And uh, Loan Depot, I think that was a new IPO. So, uh, so I think some of those are kind of interesting, and I think I would think about them as like you think about Chinese stocks, get a basket of two or three of them, and just you know don't think about them for the next three years. We've talked about the millennials and housing formation over and over. This is a catalyst where I think that, that this has become a very interesting entry point for those. Um, Boeing, if you recall, is on the claim and countdown a number of weeks ago saying that Reuters sourced uh, that Boeing had been preparing for orders that far exceeded what their uh, orders in the back half of 2022 that far exceeded what they had guided for the front half of 20, 2022. And that manifested this week when United Airlines announced an order for 200 more 737 MAX jets. So that was uh, prescient. Uh, and, uh, and we continue to like that name here. Uh, Morgan Stanley and Wells Fargo doubled their dividends, what it means for their stock. So we all know that uh, they got the, they passed the stress test. The average uh, return of capital yield between buybacks and dividends is expected to be somewhere close to 10%. So these are going to be great growers. We think that over the summer they may take a breather. This is kind of by the rumor, sell the news. Uh, 
Although there was just an enormous amount of call volume in banks today, which I thought was interesting, particularly JP Morgan. Just obscene, like like 64,000 contracts for one strike and 46,000 contracts for another. I, I still tend to think that they're going to breathe over the summer. And if you if you get lucky and you get a pullback of, of 10 or 15 percent, that's kind of your last entry opportunity for the next three years. Um, you know, I like to buy things on weakness and sell on strength. I call me old fashioned, but, uh, um, you know, Lee Cooperman, I remember he was on CNBC a year ago and he goes, you know, I don't understand these new people. They, they buy on strength and sell on weakness. I made my billions uh, and so did Warren Buffett and so did Mario Gabelli and the whole value mafia. They made all their money buying on weakness and selling on strength. It seems like common sense, but very few people do it these days. Uh, I guess guess I'm old fashioned, but it works well for me as well. So, um, okay, so so that's that. The other catalyst, obviously, for Wells Fargo, which you can't predict. My my guess would be it's closer to the time of the year, third or fourth quarter, when we think that these cyclical trades are going to really start to rip again. Um, uh, which would be removing the asset cap uh, that they that they fell under after the um, false uh, account setup scandal for some odd years ago. So, you know, am I bearish on banks? Absolutely not. Do I think there are better uses of money over the summer? Yes, I think there are greater opportunities and better ways to use. But we still have our core position in them, and and that's that. The article of the week, this you'll find interesting as it relates to sector rotation, the Luke Combs Forever After All stock market and sentiment results. This week we chose Luke Combs Billboard hit Forever After All uh, to capture the current sentiment of the stock market. The lyrics that stood out were, they say nothing lasts forever, but they ain't seen us together. Uh, and we've seen this chronic wall of worry climb for about 16 months. Uh, and since the day the Fed decided to backstop corporate credit market, naysayers have been singing nothing lasts forever and buying catastrophe insurance, which is deep out of the money S&P put options that never paid out. And they're doing the same thing again. Uh, and will and they'll eventually be right if they can stay solvent in the meantime. <laughs> That's the key. Uh, as a refresher to those who are new to our weekly notes and podcast video casts, I refer to Option Skew on a regular basis. <clears throat> and it's always worth a refresher for those of you who have been listening for a while. In simple terms, VIX measures the cost and demand of implied volatility, or cost, demand, i.e., the implied vol volatility of insurance uh, for SP puts at the money, while Skew measures the cost demand, uh, or, or more technically, implied volatility of tail risk insurance out of the money. Two standard deviation move from the mean. While this is not a comprehensive de definition, it's an easy way to think about it uh, to get the general idea. So right now the demand for tail risk insurance is high. That's concerning, but it's also a sign that many players don't believe in this rally, like Macro Chart said, uh, one foot in, one foot out all year. The wall of worry continues to be climbed, but if I were a betting man, I'd be on the lookout for a scenario where the market breathes, but does not pay off the tail risk buyers simply because there are too many of them. Uh, for the sports gamblers, this is the equivalent of a situation where your team wins, but you lose the bet because the spread was too wide. In this case, the sellers of the premium in demand, i.e. the tail risk insurance, are the bookies. They love nothing more than when you're right, i.e. the market pulls back and you still lose all your money because the pullback was shallow and they keep all your money, they keep all that premium because they sold it at such high implied volatility. Now, as you can see in the chart above, out of the last 20 times they've been aggressive bets placed on a market catastrophe, they only paid out two out of the last 20 times, 10% success rate. So all these blue lines are when people were buying huge, you know, skew is above one, or around or above 145, and the red times were the only times that they paid out. And this was kind of a modest pullback in 2014, but we still counted it. And this was more meaningful in um, late 2020, maybe 8 or 10%. And, and many of those might, even, might not have even gotten paid. But it just goes to show that more money is lost preparing for catastrophes than actual catastrophes, like Peter Lynch always said. Um, and something to keep in mind, but they will be right, and you got to keep an eye on it. Um, 
Uh, and that's why one of the reasons we like defensive. So on February 24th and March 4th, you can click here for the articles. We made the case for utilities, namely Dominion, uh, ticker D, and AEP, American Electric Power, uh, Big Pharma, Pfizer, and Novartis, and Staples, Kellogg, and Campbell, if you recall, on um, Fox Business, I said soup and cereal. The, they immediately rocketed for a couple of months and have been consolidating for the past month or so. These are defensive groups that look like they are setting up again for a second leg higher. While this setup is consistent with the nervous, nervous Nellies buying catastrophe insurance, we may see a sim similar situation where the market pulls back enough to scare money into defenses, but not enough to pay out the premium holders. Uh, let's review what happens. So that's when we put out the article. This is AEP, shot up 21% in six weeks. Uh, and now it's been resting and consolidating sideways. We think there's another leg up uh, in coming weeks and months. Same with Dominion, 20% in five, six weeks. Same type of look. And then Pfizer on the drug side, 23% in about eight weeks. Consolidating sideways, we think there's another leg up. Novartis uh, was slower out of the gate, then rocketed uh, up into early June, about 15% from in two and a half months. Now it's been resting. We think this has got more juice. Campbell Soup did a round trip. Uh, we love this here. We we used the opportunity to add to this. Um, we think this could be over, you know, fifty five dollars by before the end of the year, maybe even sixty sixty five. Uh, we, we think there's a huge opportunity here. As yields are compressed, people are going to demand yield. If you get any volatility in the market, they're going to go into defensives. And the reason it sold off was price cost that the Campbell's guy on the earnings was like, we're just passing it through to customers. You're going to see they were slow to raise prices. They'll do that. They'll keep their margins the same. These things are going to mint money and it's going to be off to the races. People are like, well, people aren't buying soup like they did during COVID and they're not, you know, cleaning themselves with Clorox and all that stuff. You know, the point is these, these things have secular demand, not cyclical number one. Um, and number two, the number one thing Campbell's could ever do if they want to get their stock up 30, 40% is change the name from Campbell Soup to Campbell Foods because they've got an unbelievable snack portfolio uh, that basically makes them like Pepsi, uh, which has given Pepsi the competitive advantage over Coke over the years. So rather than soda and snacks, Campbell's is soup and snacks, but their snack portfolio is phenomenal. Um, I eat most of them. Uh, Kellogg... Um, uh, again, same thing after that article, up 21% in, in about eight weeks. It's been consolidating, catching its breath. We think it's got another leg up here. Uh, and that's that. So these three groups seem to be setting up in a similar fashion. And this is, okay, so this is very important. We, what's interesting about these three groups is that while their relative performance to the S&P 500 has faded in recent weeks, their relative strength has increased. And this type of divergence often precedes reversals. These three groups seem to be setting up in a similar fashion to energy and bank stocks when we were aggressively suggesting them before the election. See our October 15th note here. Below you're gonna see, uh, by the way, I'll just pull this up real quick so you can just see what energy looked like when we were pounding the table on it versus now when everyone wants it. Okay, this was Wells Fargo back then at $24 uh, when we were still pounding the table there. And you can see here, and then this was energy. So the XLE was at $30 and we were laying the case out for energy here. And the same setup now is showing in uh, these three groups. So, so basically what I have here, uh, below you'll see double bottom type pattern as it relates to each sector's relative performance to the S&P 500 right before taking off. These are the type of things we look at after we've done all of our earnings analysis and fundamental work. But this is what XLE and, and uh, uh, this is energy to the S&P 500. You see the relative underperformance, this double bottom, this is XLE below, and then it just rips and takes off. Same thing here with financials over that period, double bottom, and then it just takes off. Both were top, the two top performing sectors for 2021. And now you've got the exact same thing. This is on a um, smaller scale. That's why it looks more spread out. 
look here, you've got like uh, one year and you know, you got 16 months here, you've got six months on this chart. That's why the bot, the base looks so wide, but it's doing the exact same thing. Utilities here, double utilities to the S&P 500, double bottom here, and I think we're gonna take off. Uh, and same thing with Staples, double bottom here, I think we're gonna take off again. And uh, big pharma, pharmaceuticals, kind of a double bottom here resting. I think we're gonna, gonna take off on some of these, another leg higher. Uh, as for tech, we started suggesting Splunk and Baba in our note on June 10th. You can click here for the note. They've started their ascent. Uh, Splunk is now up 30% uh, in the month of June, 30.44, and Baba's up 9.8%. Uh, so that's just getting started, but I think more good things are, are to come. I think it pulled back a little bit today, and that's to be expected because after these moves, now everyone's going to get interesting. That's when they have to shake out the new money a few few percent and then uh, hopefully push higher during this seasonally advantageous period. What I like most about our current setup is that if the nervous Nellies are right, defensives will outperform. The nervous Nellies buying all the catastrophe insurance, two standard deviations out. If they're wrong, all indications still point to it's uh, it's there. Staples Utilities Pharma turn to shine. It may simply be a reach for yield in the short term as people reach for dividend yield in periods of moderated bond yields. And you see the 10 year yield, I don't know what it closed at today, but probably below 150. It's really come off this one, you know, uh, 170 high in mid May. Last six weeks, it's, you know, dropped down to the mid 140s. Uh, and people start reaching for yield, and these groups are going to benefit. It also could presage something with regard to you know bond market is always right it could presage something with regards to this delta variant for the rest of the world that isn't as well vaccinated i think there have been three billion vaccinations distributed but you know a number of those are double so you know you figure a billion and a half and then maybe another 500 million have immunity but long and short of it is um where delta spreading fast is where people aren't vaccinated with the mrna mrna vaccines so that could maybe that's maybe what the bond market's telling you, which should help defensive over the next three months until everyone gets vaccinated around the world. And then we can pick up the reopening trade toward the end of the year, along with the taper talks. Uh, euphoria on the AAII, the retail people are euphoric again. Um, but the fear and greed shows they're still fearful. You know, neutral read here at 43. So uh, this is not usually the type of indication you get at tops. And then the National Association of Active Investment Managers, they chased up again to 90, I think what we said. So our message for the week is with Q2 earnings season coming up in the next couple of weeks, that's the next catalyst, expectations are very high. Consensus is that the S&P 500 grew earnings by 62.8% year on year, that's good news. Uh, the good news is that number will likely be beaten and come in at around plus 70%. The bad news is that you'll start hearing peak growth, peak growth, peak growth every time you turn on the TV in coming weeks and months. That may keep rates subdued in the short term. Uh, selective tech and selective defensives is where we believe the opportunity is right now for the summer as cyclicals will likely shake out some of the late money in coming months before resuming their uptrend new highs later in the year. We're still in the early stages of a new business cycle. We've modestly trimmed, taken profits on some of our cyclicals over the past month, kept core positions, and we'll potentially add back to them in coming months on weakness. Uh, we covered that last week as well. Um, this just shows you the average seasonality of the consumer staple sector over the last uh, 20 years. This is from equityclock.com. You see it dips in June and then it rips, dips and rips. And it rips during this uh, July, August, September when the rest of the market is weak. Technology, same thing, dips in June and rips. Healthcare, same story, dips in June, then rips during these weak periods of July, August, September. Um, unusual activity in BABA, here was 2,200 contracts at 420 for June of next year. Here was another 1,700 contracts uh, for June of next year at 215. I like that trade. And then um, Americans are leaving unemployment rolls more quickly in states cutting off benefits. So 25 states have cut off benefits. 25 states still have it. We've covered this. We've got the jobs report tomorrow. Maybe that will have some pressure on yields. We'll see. My base case has been that these job, you know, we've missed two months in a row. My base case was that we'd probably continue to miss or certainly not exceed in a big way 
estimates on the non-farm payrolls until September rolls off and these extended unemployment benefits expire, in which case uh, yield should stay, stay subdued. And um, the expectation for tomorrow is 700,000 job ads. You know, my bet is it comes in a bit lower than that. That should keep some pressure on yields and uh, that should help our thesis. Uh, and then after September, maybe October, November, we'll start to see big bait, big beats and the reopening trade comes back on, yields go up and all those things happen that we've been anticipating. That's our base case. If the facts change, we'll change our mind. Uh, some of the data for this week uh, so far, just cover some of the highlights. Um, uh, ISM manufacturing PMI was just uh, missed by four tenths, not a big deal. Uh, initial jobless claims were better than expected, but continuing were continue to miss. And that's the number we've been focused on. Uh, it was expected 3.38, came in at 3.46. That's the most important number. That tells me that we're probably right about a little weakness through September until the, uh, the 25 states roll off. Uh, crude inventory draw that we talked about last June has continued to happen. We'll, get, we'll see what OPEC does and Iran does, etc. cetera. Um, other than that, uh, what else? Home prices, obviously high. That's a supply demand issue. I think we got 1 million supply versus 3 million we had in 2007. So, um, you know, with lumber prices coming down, you're gonna see that supply come back on. That's why I'm looking for a spot to add to home builders in coming weeks and months. Uh, we like that play for three to five years and uh, they'll benefit from, from, uh, from those things happening. So with that said, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. We're uh, coming to you from Tampa. We'll be back in Connecticut next week. We're excited for that. We're going to surprise the kids with a few days in Disney uh, over the weekend and then get on a plane and, and be back in action. So with that said, thanks for tuning in. See you next week.